let's pray and get into the word. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together and receive from your word. We just believe that the Holy Spirit is the teacher is going to guide us and instruct us and teach us tonight from the word of God. We thank you for that. We receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 and... Uh, can't go by Romans chapter 10 without looking at verse 8. So let's start with verse 8. Uh, because my ministry, Word of Faith Ministries, is based off of this uh, particular scripture. And you'll see why in just a moment for good reason. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee. That's a King James way of saying it's close to you, near to you. Even in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. So therefore you get Word of Faith Ministries, which is my ministry, and, and uh, of course the Word of Faith Magazine, Brother uh, Kenneth Hagin's magazine, uh, come from this term, the Word of Faith. And so Paul said that the Word of Faith is what he preached. Not only that, he, he put it this way, the Word of Faith which we preach, that means not just Paul, but Barnabas and all the folks that were with him. So had a bunch of Word of Faith preachers <laughs> in the New Testament. And of course I believe the word of faith is the message of the New Testament, praise the Lord. And so uh, it's not unusual to be a word of faith believer, it's actually normal, praise the Lord. So, the word of faith which we preach, that, and then he says that, saying this is what the word of faith is that we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, so notice confession in the mouth is a key thing, we know that, and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him, Jesus, from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now the phrase shalt be saved there is the most emphatic you can have in the English language. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You shall be saved if you do these two things, which is confess Jesus as your Lord and believe that God hath raised him from the dead. Now, I would point this out just... Uh, an observation, that uh, if you've got folks that say, I'm a Christian, and they don't believe Jesus was raised from the dead, I don't know how, because this says, confessing him as Lord, believing God raised him from the dead, is how thou shalt be saved. And there are those that say, well, you know, Dr. Bill, I, Jesus being supernaturally, physically raised from the dead, I, that's, a little, that's a little extreme, don't you think? Well, yeah, praise the Lord. It's extreme because it was required. If Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead, Paul said very plainly, he says, if Jesus is not raised from the dead, we're of all men most foolish. You know, there's no reason for us to believe what we believe if he wasn't raised from the dead. So it is critical, it is a key thing to believe that he's been raised from the dead and confess him as Lord. Now this confession as Lord is not just mouthing the words, Jesus is my Lord. It is actually receiving him as Lord, confessing him as Lord, and allowing him to become Lord of your life. That means he calls the shots. Now again, there's a lot of Christians that want to get kind of get away with confessing Jesus. Yes, he was a good man, he was a great prophet, all those kinds of things, but they don't want to listen to him. And they don't want to obey, and they don't want to do what the Word says. So they're trying to kind of squeeze by and say, I'm a Christian, but I don't want it to bother my lifestyle. Again, I got a question. Have you confessed Jesus as your personal Lord, believing that God raised him from the dead and believing that he's in charge? If he's in charge, we've got to do what he says we're to do. All right, so we do that, and we'll, we shall be saved. Then he goes on to kind of explain that, give us a little background. For with the heart... Man believeth unto righteousness, which as we know is a word that means right standing with God, and with the mouth confession is made unto this salvation. Now the word salvation is a form of the word saved, which of course is the Greek word sozo. Now just a little quick Greek lesson. Uh, sozo, most people see it written out, and when you see a word written out in English that's actually a Greek word, that's called transliterated because English letters aren't Greek letters. <laughs> so they have to write out the closest 
method of saying it in such a way that the sound would be close. You know what I'm saying? So they transliterate it. So S-O-Z-O -O is how it's transliterated into English letters. You know, um, Arabic text or however you want to say it. So that text of S-O-Z-O, -O, a lot of people pronounce so-zo, but actually, again, it's transliterated. It's, it's a Greek word that when you speak it in Greek has a little quiet D sound in it. So-d-zo. All right, so to be perfectly grammatically correct in Greek, it would be so-d-zo. Just a fun fact. If you want to say so-zo, that's fine. <laughs> but I'm just passing it along. Um, so the transliteration of S-O-Z-O -O kind of implies that little D in there. But sozo means saved, delivered, healed, protected, made whole, spirit, soul, body, financially, and socially, delivered from all temporal evil. Okay, so that's a broad definition if you think about it. Saved, going to heaven, delivered, healed physically, because that's part of salvation. Uh, saved, delivered, healed, protected, so that supernatural divine protection is there. Uh, saved, delivered, healed, protected, made whole, which carries with it the idea that comes from the Hebrew word shalom. That word is another one of those words that has a lot of meaning to it. Part of that meaning of that word is that wholeness, soundness, completeness. All of that is tied up in the meaning of this word. So it's not just check the box, I'm going to heaven. That's, it's more than that. You see what I'm saying? It includes a lot of things. And isn't that just like God? You know what I mean? God is a big God, and he does things in a big way. And when you get saved, you're not just a little bit saved. You're just not, my key is punched to go to heaven saved. You are fully saved. <laughs> Back in, the, in the, when my Southern Baptist, I grew up Southern Baptist. My Southern Baptist days, we would say, saved to the uttermost. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure where that came from and what it means completely, but boy, we love to say it. We were saved to the uttermost. And it was in some of our songs, praise the Lord. But basically, we were so saved you couldn't get us unsaved. You know what I mean? <laughs> so anyway, saved, delivered, healed, protected, made whole, spirit, soul, body, financially, socially, delivered from all temporal evil, all that's included in this word, sozo and soteria, salvation, is the Greek word soteria. All right, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now, here's what I want to get into. We're talking about the importance of hearing tonight. Now, all that's kind of just for free. Uh, he goes on to say here in verse 12, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, another, go back to another good old Baptist thing. You know, how many whosoever's do we have? Everybody raise their hand. I'm a whosoever. Well, praise the Lord. I am a whosoever. And whosoever that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So it's open to everybody. Anybody and everybody that's a whosoever. Well, I'm a whosoever. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, delivered, healed, protected, made whole, spirit, soul, body, financially, socially, delivered from all temporal evil. Okay? Same word, so so. Verse 14. How then shall they call on him on whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not, here we go, heard? Notice hearing has to come before believing. Okay? That's one of those Selah moments, you know, they always talk about the word Selah in the Hebrew means to stop and think about what was just said. Hearing has to come before believing. And it's very obvious what he's talking about here because he goes on and explains it. How shall they call on him of whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel, gospel's good news, good news of peace, and bring glad tidings. Notice how gospel's always good news and glad tidings. It's not woe is me. Hallelujah. 
if you got somebody supposedly preaching the gospel and it's all woe is us and, and God's beating us down and all this kind of stuff, that's not gospel. And it's not good news. <laughs> okay? So, they bring glad tidings of good things, but, verse 16, but they have not all obeyed the gospel, the good news. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? And notice there had to be a report before they could believe it. Somebody had to preach it before they could believe it. See, that's one reason that I am very frustrated right now with our military. The military has, has picked up on this uh, political correctness of telling Christians, you may not share the gospel one with another. Now, you can evangelize, but you can't share the gospel. What? It's contradictory. They're, they're talking out of two sides of their mouth. And you can't have it that way. It's got to be one or the other. And if Christians are not allowed to share the gospel, how shall they believe unless they hear? Somebody's got to say it. Now, I can understand completely that they don't want people forcing anybody into anything, but I tell you, Christians that are truly preaching the gospel, the good news, the glad tidings, they don't force things down people's throat. Matter of fact, that is completely fruitless because you'll turn people off and they won't believe even if you hold them down. You know what I'm saying? So the best thing to do is just live a life in front of them that makes them want whatever you got and then share simply with them what the gospel is. And the key to it is what we just read over in Romans 10, 8, 9, and 10. Show them that they need to confess Jesus is their Lord, believe God raised him from the dead, and then they shout, no doubt about it, be saved. But you've got to preach the gospel. That doesn't mean you have to stand up on a soapbox on the street corner and shout and scream and wave your arms around or anything like that. It just means simply sharing. I've, I've had opportunities at work. People have come to talk to me. and What do you think about? That's usually how it starts. What do you think about what I just saw in the news? gives me an opportunity to say, well, here's what I think, and I measure what I say so that I'm not trying to be controversial, I'm not trying to stir things up, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck, you know what I'm saying? I use the opportunity to tell them about what the Word says. Well, let's, you know, let's think about what the Bible says. And then I'll give them some scripture and so forth. And, and just give them enough to whet their appetite, because they'll be back. I've seen it time and time and time again. If you don't beat them over the head with something, they'll always come back. You know, I was thinking about what you just said. And over time, you can really witness to them. I got a guy I've been working on, bless his darling heart, I've been working on him now for years. And he has recently decided he, he's going back to church. Praise the Lord. Well, I hope he goes to a good one. <laughs> I told him about faith and victory, but you know, Wherever he goes, it's better than where he's been going, <laughs> which is nowhere, <laughs> as long as they're preaching the gospel. All right. How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them which preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they've not all obeyed the gospel that was preached. For Isaiah saith, the Lord who hath believed our report. Here we go. Romans 10, 17. This is our key scripture for the importance of hearing. So then, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, this verse of scripture has been quoted and used, and I'm sure people have quoted it, you know, and talked to other folks about it. And if you're asked the question, where does faith come from? You say, from hearing the word of God. Amen. But what does this scripture actually mean? Let's dig into it and really pull out some meaning from it because there's a lot here. I wanted to read all of that that prefaced it because that sets the stage for this so then. The so then actually is a Greek word, believe it or not. Ara, A-R-A-H is the transliteration, Ara. It means the idea of drawing a conclusion or denoting an inference. Yeah, that's kind of heavy to us, maybe. But basically saying, okay, here's my conclusion. I've given you all this information. Here's the conclusion. Here's 
the point, okay? And that's what I want us to see, that verse 17 here is the point of what he just said about that you have to preach the gospel, they have to be sent to preach the gospel, they can't believe unless they hear the gospel, all of that. So then, here's the point, and that is this. Faith is the Greek word pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S, transliteration. Pistis, which means persuasion, credence, moral conviction, religious truth, truthfulness of God or religious teacher, especially reliance upon Christ for salvation, and means, and I love this, a lot of people don't know this, constancy in such profession or confession. Consistency in your confession is built into faith. Amen. The very word faith means, partially, consistency in your confession. I love that. Because a lot of people say, well, you know, I've got faith. But then you listen to them talk. Do they have faith? Because <laughs> they're sure not demonstrating it by their words. But it's built in there that it's consistency in your confession concerning faith. All right. Uh, faith cometh by hearing. Faith cometh. The word cometh is not in the original text. It's in italics, and so the translators added it in there to hopefully add to the understanding. But faith comes by what? Hearing. The word hearing is the Greek word a-k-o-e, the translator alliteration of that. A-k-o-e is a koe. It means more than the mere sense of hearing, but implies hearing and receiving the teaching. Okay, so here's what a lot of people think when they read, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I can take the Bible on tape and just set it down there and listen to it over and over and over and faith will come. Well, that's not the fullness of the meaning of it. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us over in the book of Hebrews that the children of Israel heard the word, but it did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So they heard the word, so faith should have come, but the faith that they heard, the word that they heard, did not profit them, was not profitable unto them, because they didn't mix faith with it. So what we need to do is hear the word expectantly. Hear the word taught to us, and hear it with more than the mere sense of hearing, just, not just hearing the words, but hearing and receiving the teaching. You can make a decision to receive. Or you can make a decision, nah, I don't, I don't believe that stuff. I mean, you can have two people attend a service or a meeting, and they both hear the same message. And when they go out from the church and maybe go to Denny's and, you know, have something to eat and get to talking about what they heard preached, one's like, I don't believe any of that. And the other one's like, wow, this is the greatest thing I've ever heard. This changed my life. And they're looking at him like, are you crazy? Well, they both, both heard the same thing. One heard it and rejected it. The other heard it and received the teaching. And that's what makes the difference. Hearing and receiving the teaching makes the difference. Now, let's keep reading though here. It says, faith comes by hearing and hearing. Why repeat that? I had never thought about that. And I had somebody after a, a message that I taught many years ago in a church, uh, they came up to me and they said, uh, Dr. Bell, i got a question for you. Why hearing and hearing? Why not just say faith cometh by hearing the word? I said, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Let me study that out. And that's what first got me to, to study this out and find out this word hearing is a koe. So it says... Pistis comes by a koe, and a koe comes by the word of God. A koe is hearing and receiving the teaching. Faith comes by hearing and receiving the teaching, and the hearing and the receiving of the teaching comes by the word of God. Well, what did we just talk about over in Hebrews? Hearing the word didn't profit them unless they mixed faith with it. Well, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, because you're telling me that I can't profit from hearing the word unless I mix faith with it, but faith is going to come by hearing the word, but wait a minute, it doesn't do me good to hear the word unless I mix faith with it. 
You see what I'm saying? It sounds like a contradiction, but it's not. The hearing that we need to hear, the receiving that we need to receive, comes by way of the Word of God. And so the ability to hear it and receive it comes from the ability to hear and receive it from the Word of God. Now there's a lot there. That's fairly deep. You're going to have to meditate on that one. I had to meditate on a while. But here's what will help. This will help. And that's the latter part of the verse here. All of this comes by the Word. The word, word, there, in the Greek, is rhema. Now see, there's two major words <laughs> for word. <laughs> I have to watch how I say this or I'll get all tongue-tied. There's two words for word. One is the word logos, the other is the word rhema. Logos is the written word, rhema is the spoken word. So now what were we talking about here earlier in the chapter? How shall they hear unless somebody preaches? Without hearing somebody preach a message through spoken word, faith won't come. So just having the Bible written down on a piece of paper is not the spoken word. You have to hear the word spoken, taught, a message. That's why how beautiful a feed to them that preach the gospel of, of, uh, the gospel of peace and of glad tidings because they're the ones bringing you the spoken word. Now spoken word is interesting. Because if I speak a word, what does that imply? It implies you can hear it. If I say something and don't, you know, just move my lips and nothing comes out of my mouth, you don't hear that. That's why unspoken prayer requests are so silly to me when you think about them. <laughs> I've got an unspoken prayer request. Okay. First of all, how am I supposed to agree with you when I don't know what you're praying? Because you may be praying for the cancer to come down on somebody or something. You know, I mean, I don't know. I'm certainly not going to agree with that. So how do I agree with you if I don't know what you're praying? And how can it be prayer if it's not spoken? I mean, spoken is speaking to God. Well, yes, but God knows everything and he knows my heart. Well, yeah, he does. But he also teaches us that words are important. Life and death in the power of the... Uh, tongue, not the brain, not the thought process, not what I happen to be thinking about, not even what I'm meditating on. It's by words. You have to speak. So life and death is in the power of the tongue. And when I hear somebody preach, faith cometh, because when I hear somebody preach, the ability to hear and receive the teaching is in operation. Now, like I said, man, there's some, there's some good stuff in there. <laughs> and I, I just trust you meditate it out. You listen, you listen to it and you go over it and you meditate on it and you receive the message that we're talking about here. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, that tells me that hearing is absolutely critical, of absolute importance. Let's go to Mark chapter 4. And again, I'm going to back up here just a bit, and uh, I'm going to endeavor not to preach the entire message of Romans chapter, uh, excuse me, Mark chapter four about the sower sowing the word, because it is so deep and so detailed and so involved. We'd be here for weeks, <laughs> but I'll hit the high spots. What will be like one of those those rocks on the water? <laughs> just just hit the high spots here. Mark four, verse three. Hearken. Listen closely. Behold, there went out a sower to sow. A sower is a farmer. What he sows is a seed. Okay, we'll set that up. And it came to pass as he sowed, what did he do? He sowed seed, planted seed in the ground. Some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Some fell on the stony ground where there had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because there was no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, 
And because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And the other fell on good ground and did yield fruit, and sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears, what do you do with ears? You listen, you hear. So we're talking about the importance of hearing. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Well, all of them had ears on the side of their head. There may have actually been some people there had ears on the side of their head, but were deaf. Okay? So he's not talking about just the mechanics here of hearing. He could have laid his hand on them and restored their hearing. Matter of fact, he did in a lot of cases. Amen? So let him that have ears to hear. In other words, hearing and receiving the teaching. That goes back to that definition of the word of koe. Hearing and receiving the teaching. And, he, and when he was alone, now here we go, verse 10. Now think about this. He gave this parable. And everybody that was there heard it. And they're scratching their head going, what do you mean by that? And the disciples thought that too, but they weren't going to say anything. <laughs> they want to be caught looking unspiritual. But when he was alone... They that were about him with the twelve asked him about the parable. They said, Lord, uh, what does that mean? And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. Now isn't this interesting? The mystery, not a mystery. The mystery. Because he's going to tell us a little bit here later that the whole kingdom of God is based on this principle of sowing the seed. The mystery. So this is important stuff. This is a key for us. He said, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, hearing, there's our hearing, hearing they may hear but not understand, they're not hearing and receiving and understanding the teaching, lest at any time they should be converted and... Uh, be converted and they would... Uh, my text here. And their sins should be forgiven them. My text kind of went crazy on my computer. Then he says in verse 14, here's the beginning of the explanation of his parable. Now he's going to tell them plainly what it means. The sower soweth the word. Notice that the key to understanding the parable is understanding what the seed is. Seed principle is the mystery of the kingdom of God. Now here's what's interesting about seeds. The idea of a seed is ancient. There's been seeds as long as there's been life on this planet. And scientists have been studying seeds for years, but you know what? They still cannot tell you the precise, exact mechanism that causes that seed to spring and grow up. How can there be life in a seed that for all intents and purposes is dead and dry. They've had seeds that sat in uh, pyramids for thousands of years, completely dried out, desiccated from the, the hot desert air, all the moisture pulled out of it, just dried up little seed. They put it in the ground, put a little water on it, and it springs and grows up. How in the world could that work? This is the mystery of the kingdom of God. Now one is a physical truth, the other is a spiritual truth, but it's the same principle. You got something dry and dead, you water it with the watering of the word, and it springs to life. Amen? You've heard of the term washing of the water of the, of the word from uh, over in, I believe it's 1 Peter. So let's look at it here. The sower sows the seed of the word. And these are they, by the wayside, where the word is sown. So notice, in every case, every one of these people heard the word. That means they heard the, the preaching of the word when it was preached. All right, They're all like that person we talked about with their, their buddy in the, in the meeting earlier. They both heard the same message. One received it and the other one said, I don't believe that. Well, they all heard the word. And let's, let's make sure to note that as we go through here. 
These are they, by the wayside, where the word is sown. But when Satan, but when they have heard, when they have heard, when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown where? In their heart. So the key to understanding this parable is that the word is the seed and the ground is the heart. The human heart. That's where the word will grow. That's where it will flourish. That's where it will take root and cause a benefit in your life. If you don't get the word in your heart, it's not going to benefit you. Okay? When they've heard, Satan comes immediately because he wants to take away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown, same word, sown, on stony ground. But who, when they have heard, so again, check box, yep, they heard. When they've heard the word, immediately they receive it with gladness. You ever seen anybody like that in a service? Woo, hallelujah! Man, this is good stuff. And they leave the service, This man, this is awesome. And then you see them a week later. Whoa, it's me. I'm not going to make it. Well, what happened to you? You received the word. Well, yeah, it says you received the word with gladness, but they have no root in themselves. In themselves. The ground is the human heart. They heard it, but it didn't take root in their heart. They didn't nurture it down in their heart. They have no root in themselves, because remember, you are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body, so it's in themselves. And so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction, that's the Greek word thelipsis, it means pressure. When pressure comes or persecution arises, note, for the word's sake. Satan doesn't try to st take the word out of your heart because of you. He doesn't care anything about you. He could care less about you. What he cares about is the word. He knows that the word is powerful and it's a seed and if it's planted in the human heart and starts to grow, it will do him damage. So, for the word's sake, he'll try to stop it from growing in your heart because that's the ground. He'll try to get it out of the ground. Satan comes immediately, takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These little likewise which are sown on stony ground who when they hear the word immediately receive with gladness and have no root in themselves and so endure for a time. Afterward, when the pressure or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are, interesting, offended. Offense will stop the action of the word of God. You ever notice when pastor's talking about how people get offended at him as pastor? the effect it has on their lives. And it's never a good effect. It never leads to great and glorious, joyous things in your life. Offense. It will stop the action of the word. Don't take offense. That's the interesting thing about that phrase, take offense. Somebody can offend you and you can refuse to take it. It's a decision on your part. You can say, you know, they can throw stuff at you and say, well, rah, 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 and just fuss at you and say things that are hateful to you. And you can make a decision. I will not be offended. I am by choice going to walk in love. I'm going to ignore what they're trying to do here because really it's not them, it's the devil. He's the one trying to stop the action of the word in your life. He's after the word. He's, he doesn't care about you personally. You're not that big a deal. <laughs> All right? Not to him. You are to God, but not to him. And so, the persecution rises for the word's sake immediately. They're offended. Verse 18, these are they which are sown among thorns, such as, there's our checkbox, hear the word and the cares of this world. Cares, anxiety, worry, all of that's tied up in the meaning of that word. The cares of this world the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust, which is inordinate desire, of other things, anything other than the word, doesn't matter what it is, could be a Harley. <laughs> oh, no, not that. <laughs> Whatever. That can come in, enter in. Notice it has to enter in. If, it's, if it doesn't enter in, it's not going to do this. But if it enters in, it will choke the word and it, the word 
will become unfruitful in your life. Now, wait a minute, Dr. Bill. Hold on. The Word of God, the very Word that God used to create this whole universe when He said light be and light was, and it slung out into the universe all matter at the speed of light. That Word can be made unfruitful in my life by this process? Yeah, sad but true. It's not, not a problem with the Word. The Word's perfectly fine. The same seed was planted Think about that. Same seed, same message. They all heard. The difference was the preparation and the condition of the ground, which is your heart. That's all about what you need to do. The preparation that you need to have for your heart yourself. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in Choke the word, and the word becomes unfruitful in your life. Now, the word doesn't become unfruitful generally. It becomes unfruitful in your life. It can't grow. So there's no, nothing wrong with the word. The problem is with the soil. These are they which are sown on good ground, such as, check, heard the word. They hear the word, and they receive the word. There's the difference. Hearing and receiving the teaching. They heard the word, they received the word, and it brought forth fruit. So it grew, it blossomed, it continued to grow until it produced fruit. Some 30-fold, and some 60, and some 100. Now what that tells me is that even among those who are successful in their Christian walk and in their operation of faith and in hearing and receiving of the word and in studying and meditating of the word and preparing their heart and all those good things, there's degrees of success. Amen. So what's the difference? Same word. The guy that produced 30-fold, same word. Guy that produced 60-fold, same word. Guy that produced 100-fold, same word. What's the difference? How he prepared his heart what he did with the word. Gets back to the, to the guy that lifts weights. If I went in and started lifting weights, little old five-pound weights, oh, man, I'm, boy, I'm doing something big here. Whew. This is good stuff. I'm going to get strong. Well, if I do that every day with those little old five-pound weights, I'm going to develop some strength. But then there's a guy who starts with the 5-pound weights, works his way up to the 10-pound weights, and then the 20-pound weights, and then the 100-pound weights, and then he starts pressing 200-pound weights, and he's, uh, <laughs> he's a little more developed than I am with my little 5-pound weights. Now, I'm being consistent. I'm lifting the weights. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, but I'm not pressing. I'm not... Pushing. I'm not developing. I, I don't move from the 5 to the 10, and the 10 to the 20, and the 20 to the 30. I don't push myself a bit. There's no saying among weightlifters, no pain, no gain. Now what they mean by that is not that they want to hurt themselves. That's not the purpose. What they're saying is work your way up to the point that you feel like I can't do any more. Stop and let your muscles rest because that's when they build up muscle tissue is the resting stage. Let your muscles rest and then go back and press again. But you've got to keep pressing. You've got to keep building. So you get to that point, you just can't do any more, and you say, okay. Well, that's the point you stop, and you let your muscles rest and relax and strengthen themselves, muscle tissue grows, then you come back the next time and you start lifting those weights again, you keep building up until you get past that point. So that's what we're talking about here, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. You may or may not produce 100-fold first time out of the gate when you operate in faith. But I tell you what, a 30-fold is pretty good. It's an increase. Amen? See, 30-fold isn't just an addition of 30, it's 30-fold. It's, it's a multiplication. So 30-fold is not bad. 60-fold is better. 100-fold is even better. But it's a process, and it's something you've got to grow into. And a walk of faith means development. You notice what Jesus said about it? He said, if, those two little letters, I-F, if 
you continue in my word, you will be my disciples indeed. The word disciple means disciplined believer. He wants us to be disciplined. He wants us to have a regimen. We're talking spiritually, not physically. Because the Bible does tell us that physical exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. There's nothing wrong with exercise. It's good for you. But it profits in the, only in the physical area. Godliness profits in all things. So if we exercise ourselves unto godliness, it will benefit us physically, it will benefit us mentally, we'll renew our mind to the Word of God, and it will benefit us spiritually. And we'll grow from 30 to 60 to 100 fold. So, whoo, hallelujah, this is all good stuff, but it's just kind of a side topic. We chased us a rabbit. Let's get back to it here. Verse, uh, where did we leave off? Let's, uh, let's look at verse 21. He said in them, as a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed, and not to be set on a candlestick, for there is nothing hid which should not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret but that it should come abroad, meaning he has revelation knowledge for us, and he will reveal it from his word. If any man has ears to hear, let him hear. And then verse 24 says, And he said unto them, Take heed what you hear, for with the measure you meet it shall be measured to you, and unto you that hear shall more be given. So in other words, the measure with which I hear the word is the measure by which my faith will grow. Now that's not talking about amount of word you listen to specifically. It's talking about you hear the word taught, you receive the word taught, you meditate on it, you build it into your spirit, and that type of hearing, hearing and receiving the teaching, will lead to success in this area. Revelation knowledge, manifestation of that revelation knowledge. If any man has ears to hear, let him hear. But notice what he says, take heed what you hear. I want to talk about that what you hear. There's two scriptures we want to look at. Hold your place there at Mark 4 because we're going to come back to it. But then go over to Luke chapter 8 and uh, verse 18. Same study here, same teaching concerning the sower says the word, but from Luke's perspective. And what does he say here? Jesus said while he was teaching this in Luke 8, 18, Take heed therefore how you hear. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, whosoever hath not from him shall be taken, even that which he seemeth to have. So one time here, Jesus made the statement, Take heed what you hear. Another time in the same teaching, Luke heard him say, Take heed how you hear. So there's two points about hearing we need to latch on to. Take heed what you hear, take heed how you hear. Now what's the difference? The difference is the circumstance of the hearing. Okay? Another Salem moment. We need to stop and think about that. The difference is the circumstance of the hearing. Take heed what you hear is a decision you make about what it is you are listening to. Okay? That's a decision you make based on your preference, your situation, your right to listen to whatever you want to listen to. You're not being forced to listen to anything in particular. You just make a decision, I'm going to listen to this, whatever it is. Maybe it's a message, maybe it's a particular teacher, maybe it's a TV program, maybe it's a song. Whatever it is, you decide you're going to listen to it. Jesus said, take heed what you hear. But then he says, take heed how you hear. The how you hear is a circumstance where you're out there, maybe at work, and you're listening to a conversation and they start talking about stuff and you think, oh my goodness, this is so unscriptural. But you can't really just run away. <laughs> You're, you're kind of stuck there, and you're listening to it, 
but you can take heed how you hear it. You don't have to be there like that little bird with his mouth open and just eat it all up and take whatever they're saying. You can listen to it with an ear of how does this line up with the Word of God. I listen to you know people at work and they're talking about me, I don't like this, I don't like that, and this guy's this, and that guy's that. And they say all these things, terrible things sometimes. And I'll find myself thinking, what's the Word have to say about this situation? What's the Bible say that they should be thinking and saying and doing? How, should, how could they walk in love concerning this situation? In other words, I take heed how. I filter it. Maybe I'm hearing the words, but I don't have to just latch onto it and agree. Woe is me. I'll tell you, I'll give you a good example. And people, <laughs> pastor even likes to pick on me. When I'm sitting out there, he's preaching, and he'll say, Yeah, Dr. Bill, love you. that confession detector. Back in the day, I was one of those that was at one of those confession alarms. Somebody, you know, would say something, I'd say, that's your confession and I believe every word of it. I was one of those guys. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. I mean, I was really aware of my words. You know what I'm saying? Maybe I, maybe I was uh, overzealous. But at the same time, now, and I don't do that these days for people. I don't blow them out of the water. Unless they have asked me to help them guard their confession. If we have some kind of agreement that, listen, if I say something that's unscriptural, I want you to stop me and tell me because I want to catch that. I want to train myself not to speak contrary to the Word of God. Then I've got carte blanche and my confession detector is going to beep real loud. Okay? So I was at one time a confession beeper. And that's what pastor likes to pick on me about. But the thing about it is, take heed how you hear. When you hear somebody, you don't have to just side in. Now, here's, here's a good example. This is, this is one of my pet peeves. Something about us here in the South, I don't know what it is. Everybody's got the habit of just saying, without thinking about it, I absolutely can guarantee you they do not mean to say these words. It just comes out of their mouth. Take care. Okay? So I may be going through McDonald's and I may be getting myself a sausage, egg, and cheese biscuit and a cup of coffee. And I'll pick it up from the window and I'll start to drive off and the lady will say, take care. And I always say, no, thank you. Now they don't even know what I'm talking about. They have no idea what I'm saying or what I'm doing. And they probably look at me like, boy, he's a nut. Yeah, but I'm a happy nut, praise the Lord. They're trying to get me to take care. The Bible said, do not take or receive care or anxiety. That worry and care and anxiety is not of God, and I should not be receiving it. Just like I don't take offense, I don't want to take care. Okay? So when they tell me specifically, on purpose, out of their own mouth, directed at me, take care, I'll say, no, thank you. And as a matter of fact, typically what I'll do, under my breath, I'm not trying to fuss at them. I'm not trying to embarrass them. But I'll say to myself under my breath, I don't take or receive care, thank you, in Jesus' name. I'm guarding myself from taking care because I am not to take care. Oh, Dr. Bill, that's just silly. No, it's not. I'm training myself to be aware of what I'm hearing. I'm taking heed how I hear I'm not going to let them try to push care off on me. I'm not going to let them try to push prejudice off on me. I'm not going to let them try to push hatefulness off on me. People can say things. It will go into your hearing, and whatever goes into your hearing goes down into your heart, and it gets down in there in abundance and then finally comes out of your mouth, and before too long you're taking care. Take care. You find yourself saying that. Or you'll find yourself saying something like, Oh, that just like to kill me. Well, I don't want to die. Life and death is in the power of the tongue, so I'm not going to go around saying it like to kill me. I don't sing songs that have death in them. I just don't. Christian songs that have death in them. Let me give you just a couple here. 
I did a little research today. I looked at uh, a list online of contemporary Christian songs. Now I listen to contemporary Christian music. I don't know about everybody else. I'm not one of these uh, Southern Gospel kind of guys. You know what I'm saying? And I have a very eclectic style of music that I listen to. I listen to everything from rock, Christian rock, like Petra, which admittedly is 1980s. Okay, I'm dating myself a bit. But, yeah, I listen to Petra. But I also listen to Kirk Franklin. Okay? I particularly like Stomp. I don't know what it is about Stomp, but I like that. Okay? Uh, Andre Crowd. You know? All kinds of different things that I listen to. So I go kind of from jazz to rock to folk, you know, a little bit of everything. But I always listen to the lyrics. Because I'm going to be saying those lyrics. David Ingalls, bless his heart, had a song. I don't sing those songs anymore. Like Born to Lose and Of the Life Before. He didn't sing those kind of songs anymore. Now he used to because he used to be one of these guys that played a piano in a bar. And he was singing Born to Lose. Get people crying in their beer. So that's why he wrote that song. I don't sing those songs anymore like Born to Lose and Of the Life Before. So I don't sing those songs either. So this song is one that was supposed to be on the contemporary Christian music charts. It's supposed to be really high up on the list. It's by a guy named Josh Wilson. I don't know who that is. And it's called Carry Me. Okay, here's the lyrics. I try to catch my breath. It hasn't happened yet. I'm wide awake in the middle of the night, scared to death. So I prayed to God, would you make this stop? Father, pre please hold on to me. You're all I've got. Carry me, carry me now from my sinking sand to your solid ground. Well, that's good. He's going to solid ground, but he's confessing sinking sand. The only way I'm ever going to make it out is if you carry me. Okay, I'll buy that. But that's not what he's saying as his confession. His confession is, I'm wide awake in the night, scared to death. Now, he ends up on a good note, carry me, Lord, carry me, carry me. Okay, fine, that's good. But I don't want to be confessing that. I'm glad that he relies on the Lord, don't get me wrong. But I'm paying attention to what I'm saying out of my mouth. Okay, here's another one. You are, I am, by mercy me. Now, I like mercy me pretty well, but listen to the lyrics. I've been the one to shake with fear and wonder if you're even here. I've been the one to doubt your love, and I've told myself you're not enough. Contemporary Christian hit song. Now, he redeems this a little later in the song. Because he's basically what he's doing. He's setting himself up as being, woe is me, poor old me, but you're, you're out there, God. And that's a good thing. But what is he confessing? What's he saying? I've been the one to shake with fear. Well, fear is the reciprocal of faith. It's the opposite of faith. I don't want to be involved with fear at all. I reject fear. I wonder if you're even here. God is always present. He will never leave us or forsake us. I've even been one to doubt your love. <laughs> Are you kidding? God is love. I've told myself, you're not enough. He's all there is, guys. Okay, okay. But we keep reading. We keep going. I've been the one to try and say I'll overcome by my own strength. I've been the one to fall apart and start to question who you are. Then he starts getting positive. You're the one that conquers giants. You're the one that calls out kings. You shut the mouth of lions and tell the dead to breathe. You're the one that walks through fire and take the orphan's hand. You're the one Messiah. You are, I am. Well, praise the Lord. But before he got to that, he's confessing how sorry he is. Now, I'll tell you something. I'll tell you how far I take this. And this, this some people are going to get mad at me. People on the Internet are going to fuss at me. I don't care. Amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. I used to be a wretch. But I got saved. I ain't a wretch anymore. 
So I don't, I don't sing that part of the song. Now, I love Amazing Grace, and I sing the song, but I make a word substitution. Who saved a man like me? Simple substitution that allows me to sing the song and not get anybody bent out of shape with me without making a confession of that I'm a wretch. Yeah, but Dr. Bill, you were a wretch before you got born again. Yes, you're right, but I'm born again now. And I sing that song now. So right now, it would be improper for me to say I'm a wretch because I'd be saying that what Jesus did for me in my life is not enough to unwretchify me. It's not a word, but you got it. Now, on the other hand, David Ingalls has a song, I Am the Righteousness of God in Christ. Now, let's listen to these lyrics that I'm saying out of my mouth. I am the righteousness of God in Christ, a brand new creation in Him. I can now approach the presence of God with no condemnation of sin. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am now complete in Him. I'm a partaker of His divine nature. On me, He will not impute sin. Now that's a confession I can make and be 100% scriptural about it. And now, Dr. Bill, you're getting all, you're getting all religious on us. No, I'm serious about my words. So I pay attention to what I sing and what I say. You know, there's a lot of songs. I love the songs and I love the tune and the meter and everything, but the lyrics I just can't sing. And I'll find myself going, I just can't say it because I'm not going to let it come out of my mouth. I've been crucified with Christ, crucified, buried with Him. We are one with Him in righteousness after we became one in sin. He became as we were that we might be as He is now. That's scriptural. He became one with us in death. We became one in life with Him. I'm confessing that I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. So I'd much rather sing that song. Here's one for you by Petra. I was talking about how I like Petra. Petra's got a song called Creed. I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son. I believe in the virgin birth. Glory to God. <laughs> I believe in the man of sorrows, bruised for iniquities. I believe in the Lamb who was crucified and hung between two thieves. I believe in the resurrection on the third and glorious day. I believe in the empty tomb and the stone, stone that the angel rolled away. He descended and set the captives free. Went into hell, set the captives free. And now he sits at God's right hand and prepares a place for me. This is my creed, the witness I have heard, the faith that has endured. The truth is, this truth is assured. Through the darkest ages past, though persecuted it will last, and I will hold steadfast to this creed. Amen. Now I can get behind that. I believe he sent his spirit to comfort and to reveal to lead us into truth and light, to baptize and to seal. I believe that he will come back the way he went away and receive us all into himself, but no man knows the day. Now that's scriptural. I believe he's the judge of all men, small and great. The resurrected souls of men receive from him their fate, some to death and some to life and some to their reward, some to sing eternal praise forever to our Lord. Amen. I mean, there's just nothing wrong with that. <laughs> and so I can sing that and I can rock out, hallelujah, with that song. And, and do it freely and be excited and not even have to worry about my confession. Not that I worry. <laughs> but you see what I mean. We need to pay attention. Take heed what we hear. Take heed how we hear. And that leads to us taking heed what we say. Because what you say... See, this is something that David Ingalls talks about, and the reason he says, I don't sing those songs anymore, is what I am saying out of my mouth when I'm singing is a confession of my faith. Songs, words that are in songs, come from your spirit. That's why... See, Satan was the musician in heaven. That's why he has perverted music to his own ends. Now, that doesn't mean all music, because there's some great music out there, and there's some great words and lyrics out there. 
but he will take music and, and get that music to go right into your heart, get in your heart in abundance and come out of your mouth and you'll be saying things that if you would listen to yourself, you would just wonder, how in the world can I be confessing this? I had to eliminate a whole lot of music from my repertoire <laughs> when I was growing up, uh, right before I went to college, as a matter of fact. I got real serious about it, and uh, I had, you're not going to believe this, I had the entire collection of Alice Cooper records. I was a huge Alice Cooper fan, okay? Now, <laughs> praise the Lord, Alice Cooper got saved. Amen. I'm certainly glad he did. But he sure wasn't when he was writing these songs. And he was singing about, you know, how his fans were his stars that worshipped him. <laughs> and he, oh man, he, the lyrics, but I tell you, the music and the orchestration, it just sucks you in. And before you know it, you're singing the ballad of Dwight Fry and about, I'm going crazy. And enjoying yourself while you're doing it. And I started paying attention to that, and I tell you what got my, this is what actually got my attention, is I'm driving down there, and I got an eight-track tape, this will date it. I got an eight-track tape, and I'm playing music, and I'd actually pulled the eight-track out, and I was driving down the road, and I just, the night before this, I guess, I'd seen Hee Haw. And I was <laughs> driving my car and singing it full voice, gloom, despair, and agony on me. And I'd just go on, and I'd go on, and I'd go on, and I'd sing that. And the Lord said, stop it! I said, yes, sir. He said, what are you singing? I thought it was just a silly song. He said, what are the words? Gloom, despair, agony on you. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I would have no luck at all. He said, is that really what you want? I said, no. <laughs> then why are you saying it? But Lord, I don't mean it that way. Yeah, but you're saying it. And if you're saying it, it's getting down in your heart, and it's getting down in your abundance, and it's coming out your mouth, and you're glooming and despairing all the way down this highway. Well, then I got to looking at that eight track. I said, I can't sing that either, can I? He said, not if you want to grow spiritually. Not if you want to develop in the areas that I want you to develop in. And I went, okay. <laughs> well, at the time, there wasn't the kind of contemporary Christian music we have today. And so I went looking. And I tried to find some. And I found this eight track by this group called Free Spirit that was fluffy... It was just the other side of uh, Southern Gospel. A little bit more folkish sounding. And I plugged it in and listened to it and went, Oh, Lord, I can't listen to this. It's like elevator music. And so he said, Well, it's better what you were listening to. So I play that. But then I found Phil Keggy. And I found other contemporary Christian artists. And Petra, finally, in the 80s late 70s, early 80s, and praise the Lord, I found some stuff I could listen to. Then Brother Copeland started singing about, you know, uh, Covenant Man and uh, I cannot be defeated and I will not quit, redeemed by the blood of Jesus. I've been loose from Satan's pit, praise the Lord, all that. So I started singing those songs. Now again, it's not my style, but I would sing it. David Ingalls, got a hold of him, started singing that. He and I are in the same range vocally. And so I had a lot of fun with David Ingalls. And just, you know, changed what I listened to. Changed what I was singing. I, I was looking today online. I've got 106 albums now of contemporary Christian music that are at least acceptable. There's a few that are... And Belinda will tell you exactly which ones. Because <laughs> she likes to tell me, wow, do you listen to that? I'm like, sorry, so I'm still working on it. But for the most part, matter of fact, just today, I got a, uh, an album by Kenneth Copeland. That actually, he came out with in 2002 that I didn't, I didn't know about. It's called The God of Abundance. I had not heard that album. 
And so I was listening to that day, and whoo, this is good stuff. So, you know, praise the Lord. I'm still looking, but I'm getting some good things out there to listen to. But the point is, we are, spiritually speaking, what we hear. And you have a choice to take heed what you hear, but you also have a choice to take heed how you hear. So if I hear something that's unscriptural, I'll just remind myself, well, the Word of God says, the Word of God says, the Word of God says, and then I can at least filter the effect of it. Now, it still doesn't mean I want to expose myself to that. That's only if I can avoid it. But the what you hear, I can make those choices. Amen? So, what I want you to take away from this night is some homework. <laughs> Go home and look at your albums and your songs and your magazines and your programs and whatever it is you listen to consistently and try to make some decisions as to whether they're helping you or hurting you. Because I think most of you are like me. You want to develop spiritually. You want to grow spiritually. You want to be, you know, God's man or woman or faith and power. You know, not paste and flour, but faith and power. <laughs> So in order to do that, you're going to have to pay attention to what you're listening to because faith cometh by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. Notice that's an ongoing, continual, positive, present tense form. Not having heard the word, even though it's the spoken word, even though it's the rhema word, it's not the having heard, it's the hearing and hearing and hearing. Ongoing, progressive, uh, present tense. That's what we need to be surrounding ourselves with is the Word of God. That's why things like Word of Faith Radio, Internet Radio, I listen to that at work, and I'm listening to people teach me the Word all day long through Word of Faith Radio, and Brother Copeland's Roku channel, and, and Brother Hagen's Rhema Roku channel, and, and our Roku channel, speakfaith.tv, where we have all these messages that we have and pastor's messages out there on the Roku. All of those things are opportunities to surround ourselves with the hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing that will benefit us and help us to grow. Praise the Lord. Did you get anything out of this tonight? I had fun. I don't know about you, but I had fun. <laughs> Praise the Lord.